Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Battlefield, Pennsylvania. Today we're at the Senator John Hines History Center in Pittsburgh. In September of 1862, the Allegheny Arsenal suddenly and mysteriously exploded. Dozens died, and the day remains the single worst civilian loss of life of the American Civil War. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. Joining me today to discuss the Allegheny Arsenal explosion is the CEO and President of the John Hines History Center, Andy Masick and Jim Wodarczyk, investigator of the Lawrenceville Historical Society. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. You bet. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background in history. Well, my background in history, uh, when I was 10 years old, I found a, a mini ball, a 69 caliber bullet, just like the ones they were rolling and turning into cartridges at Allegheny Arsenal in 1862. And from that time on, I was hooked on history and became a historical archaeologist, uh, a museum curator, uh, and then eventually a museum director. Jim? Well, back in 1980, I started to research the Allegheny Arsenal, and I was shocked that there was no chronological history written in Pittsburgh up to that point. So I put together a manuscript for the predecessor of the John Hines History Center, the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania, and that became the basis for my 1999 book, Pittsburgh's Forgotten Allegheny Arsenal. And ever since then, I've been researching for the Lawrenceville Historical Society, the Allegheny Arsenal, as well as other topics. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of a city was Pittsburgh in the 1850s leading up to the Civil War? Well, it was a smoky city. There's no question about it. They called it the Iron City then. This was before steel. Uh, they were uh, making things of iron. And in 1814, the U.S. government set up uh, an arsenal here right on the banks of the Allegheny River uh, to produce cannon shot and other war materiel during the War of 1812. Um, lots of people uh, worked at that arsenal, uh, from hundreds in the uh, early years to uh, well over a thousand during the Civil War years. And it's uh, Allegheny Arsenal that helped make Pittsburgh the arsenal of the Union during the Civil War. Well, I'd like to say is in 1850, what you have is a very small geographic area of about several square miles compared to 60 square miles today. It's very densely populated, and when we're talking about the Allegheny Arsenal, it's, all, it's three miles away from the Pittsburgh's point. However, that at that time was very rural, and you want to place your arsenal away from the population center, so in case of there is an explosion, it minimizes loss to lives and property. Yeah. You know, a lot of uh, your viewers may not know that Pittsburgh is nestled between three rivers. The Allegheny and the Monongahela uh, converge at the place we call the point and turn into the Ohio River. Uh, George Washington had figured out that that's uh, a strategic place uh, when the French claimed it in uh, 1753. And so from that time on, Pittsburgh became a place uh, for a fortification, uh, Fort Duquesne and later Fort Pitt, uh, and then a settlement grew up around that fort. Uh, of course, Indian peoples had lived here uh, for hundreds of years, and right on the site where Allegheny Arsenal eventually was built, uh, there was a Lenape or Delaware village, Shanapin's Town, it was called. So that convergence of rivers has always been a place that has attracted people. And by the middle of the 19th century, it became a manufacturing center because Pittsburgh was then the gateway to the West. I was gonna say in addition to iron manufacturing, we also had glass manufacturing. We were the hub of the oil industry in its early days. We made a lot of steamboats here as well as the machine parts for steamboats. So Pittsburgh had a reputation for making things long before the arsenal. That's right. What was it about the region that made it so hospitable to manufacturing? Cheap coal. And uh, even before that, wood. Uh, the wood was used to uh, burn for fuel, and then the rivers became uh, highways. Uh, remember, this is very hilly country. It was uh, densely wooded. You just couldn't get 
uh, overland. So people traveling westward would take those river transportation corridors. Uh, and the Ohio River, of course, fed into the Mississippi and into the Missouri River. And so this truly was a gateway to the, the western wilds. And this was sort of the last place that you could get uh, manufactured goods, packaged foods, uh, clothing, leather goods, wagons, as Jim says, boats as well. Who were Pittsburghers? Where did they come from? How did they look? How did they live? Well, originally we had a large number of English and Scots-Irish people and were largely, in the early days, very native-born population. It's only about the 1840s and 1850s that we start to see the immigration of Irish and immigrants as well as Germans into the Pittsburgh area. I like to think of Pittsburgh as um, having waves of population. Uh, of course, uh, in the earliest years, um, a thousand years ago, uh, those first peoples uh, built um, mounds and had farms along the rivers that would overflow their banks and flood uh, fields. By the time George Washington arrived in the 1750s, those first peoples were already gone. Uh, perhaps uh, it was war or uh, disease that had uh, caused the die-off of that first population. But then there'd be these successive waves of other uh, peoples, uh, French uh, trappers and uh, traders, uh, English and Scottish uh, settlers, uh, and then by the uh, 1800s, Germans in large numbers. And by the uh, middle of the 19th century and early 20th century, people from Eastern Europe. Each successive wave left pockets or pools of people. And each neighborhood in Pittsburgh, and there are a hundred of them, have their own ethnic identity, partly because the pools of, of peoples that were left after these waves of migration. Uh, Abraham Lincoln once called the Civil War a political crisis. What was the politics of Pittsburgh in the 1850s and 60s? Well, you have to say start with uh, 1849 through 1857. We, until 1852, there is no Republican Party. And the first Republican Party is founded in Ripon, Wisconsin, and it spreads like wildfire. They're not really organized. They don't really organize as a national institution until they hold a, a convention right here in Pittsburgh in February 1856. If you look at the mayors of Pittsburgh between 1849 and 1864, you find that two of them were Whigs. One was a Democrat. One was a party called the American Party, which they didn't like Catholics or Masons or immigrants. Um, you had one that ran as a coalition of know-nothings and Whigs. And you also had one man who was sitting in jail when he was elected mayor, and he ran on a coalition ticket of the People's Party and the anti-Catholic ticket. Between 1857 and 1864, we have three successive Republican mayors. Boy, he is just a font of information. I was going to do some uh, color commentary since you mentioned Lincoln and crises. On February 14, 1861, Abraham Lincoln visited here in Pittsburgh. He considered Allegheny County the banner county of the Union, he said, because he thought it, it had helped tip the vote in Pennsylvania uh, in his favor. So he came here on his way to Washington to be inaugurated in February of 1861. And it was pouring down rain, it was uh, awful conditions. He went to the Monongahela House overlooking the Monongahela River and he told everyone, come back tomorrow and I'll make a speech then. Well, more than 5,000 people turned out uh, in the rain with their umbrellas to, to hear this new president. And he stood on that balcony overlooking the Monongahela River and someone shouted out, uh, Mr. Lincoln, will there be war? And he thought just a minute and he said, there is no crisis but an artificial one. No crisis but an artificial one. It's up to those people of the South. And he pointed across the Monongahela River toward the uh, South. It's up to them to determine whether there will be war. So uh, even as late as February of 1861, Lincoln had some hope that this war could be averted. Uh, he thought that the political 
forces had gotten us into this war hysteria, but there really wasn't a crisis. Uh, it was an artificial one constructed by politicians. Do you agree with them? Well, I have to say that uh, I think the war could have been averted if cooler heads had prevailed. But the root cause of the war, slavery, was um, so pervasive, uh, uh, so insidious, that uh, I think, as John Brown said, the sins of this guilty land can never be purged but with blood. And I think it actually needed a war to end the evil of slavery. Jim? What I find interesting is during the Lincoln visit, People were not so much concerned in Pittsburgh when they started firing questions at the president-elect about slavery. They were worried about the tariffs. They wanted Western Pennsylvania industries to be protected from cheap foreign imports. Uh, if you would have visited the Allegheny Arsenal in 1860, 1861, this is an impressive place. Could you give us maybe a mind's eye tour of what the arsenal would have looked like? Well, let, let me take a stab at it, and then and you can fill in the details, because you, you live right there. You know a it. It's like the away. back of your hand. Uh, but it's about uh, 37 acres on the banks of the Allegheny River. It extends all the way from the Allegheny back to Penn Avenue. Uh, big city blocks between 40th and 39th Street. They used to call 39th Street Pike. Uh, street or Pike Avenue. And the grounds from the very beginning were very well uh, designed and uh, maintained uh, with stone walls and stone buildings, brick buildings. Uh, there weren't a lot of cheap uh, constructions here because the U.S. government realized it needed in the West uh, a major U.S. arsenal. And so they built to last. And by the time of the Civil War, uh, there were a thousand people working at this uh, arsenal. It was turning out uh, tens of thousands of rounds of small arms ammunition every day, all types of field artillery ammunition, six pounder, 12 pounder, 24 pounder shells and canister and spherical case shot. Um, plus lots of other tools and equipment needed by uh, artillerymen and infantrymen. Uh, they never produced cannons here and they didn't uh, produce any small arms themselves, but the government inspectors who were here uh, did inspect some of those types of things. The other thing that's really striking about early Allegheny Arsenal is the, the quality of leadership that they had. Uh, the innovative ordnance officers who worked there, uh, men like Thomas Jackson Rodman, who uh, built one of the first bullet machines in uh, U.S. history. Instead of pouring bullets uh, with hot lead into a mold one at a time, letting it cool, opening up that mold, trimming it off, uh, he invented a process for taking uh, a tube of lead uh, and have a lead slug cut off, smashed into a die. This is called swaging. And in one quick motion, making uh, a cylindro conoidal hollow based bullet called a mini ball. Well, this little bullet revolutionized war. Uh, and during the Civil War, you probably know, nearly 750,000 Americans died. And the battlefield casualties were especially high, partly because of the effectiveness of these small arms that fired mini balls that were produced at places like Allegheny Arsenal. But Thomas Jackson Rodman went on to invent the largest cannons ever produced in U.S. history, in world history. Uh, in the late 1850s, he patented a process for hollow casting iron cannons. And that means instead of just pouring iron into a mold, uh, letting it air cool, and then boring out uh, the center of the, the bore of the gun, he put a pipe down the center of the casting, poured the metal in, and then pumped air and water through that core plug, which cooled the gun from the inside out. 
that made it harder and denser and stronger so it wouldn't blow up uh, with high powder charges and great pressures. That was uh, an amazing innovation and by the end of the war all of the large cannons used uh, in the U.S. service were made using the Rodman process. And the biggest gun ever made, a 20-inch caliber Rodman Columbiad, uh, well, it's still the biggest gun the Americans have ever produced. Well, in addition, we produced gun carriages, caissons, and limbers, made leather goods, and stamped out leather or metal parts uh, out of brass for brass plates that would go on uh, various pieces of the leather equipment. I think uh, what's most interesting about the Allegheny Arsenal is that at the time of the Civil War, there are 60 structures. Now, when we talk about structures, some of them are very small. They're sheds or maybe even an outhouse. But there are at least 29 buildings of major proportion. They, around 1859, in the ordinance report that was submitted to Washington, they did construct a frame laboratory, while most of the other buildings were stone and brick. This is one of the few laboratories that's actually constructed of wood, and that's where the famous explosion would take place. 37 acres, it sounds more like a small town than, than an arsenal, uh, but Allegheny Arsenal wasn't the only arsenal in town, is that right? It was the only one in Pittsburgh. The next closest one was Frankfurt on the outskirts of Philadelphia. But there were other manufacturers of military goods. There were uh, caisson makers and military vehicle makers and leather good makers. And what would happen with government arsenals during this period is they'd often contract for goods, much as happens in the United States uh, War Department or uh, the uh, Defense Department today, uh, you'll, you'll send out a request for proposals and get bids in, and then government inspectors will inspect the uh, material to make sure it meets government specs. So there was a lot of activity going on in uh, Pittsburgh. People making buff leather and uh, wagon wheels for cannon carriages, casting guns, those big guns that I mentioned, the 20-inch caliber Columbiads, they were actually cast at the Fort Pitt foundry just a, a mile or two from Allegheny Arsenal. So there was a, a military industrial complex here in early Pittsburgh, but it wasn't all right at the Arsenal. So the Arsenal is a government operation. It's not it's not private. That's correct. Right. So the military would have been in charge of the day-to-day -day operation? Yes. Okay. And most of the commanders were West Point graduates. And some of the employees were military people, but some were civilian contractors. Uh, and we'll, we can talk more about uh, Alexander McBride, who's the civilian contractor who's in charge of the ammunition laboratories. And that's where the terrible accident uh, occurred in 1862. Uh, in your research, uh, how, does that, how does that dynamic work? You have military leadership, but they're commanding civilian workers. Was there any problems with that? And I don't, well, there was during the Civil War in 1864 during the election when certain military officers told anybody that worked at the Allegheny Arsenal that if you don't vote for Abraham Lincoln, you're going to be fired. But beyond that, we do the same thing of using civilian contractors today for our military goods. I think there probably was some rivalry between uh, West Point trained ordnance officers and civilian contractors. Uh, the, the Army guys really knew their business and they had to train and oversee the civilian contractors. So there, there might have been some tension between them. Uh, remember those civilian contractors didn't make very much money either. Um, many of the people working at the arsenal uh, were very poorly educated immigrants. Um, young girls, 12 to 16 years old, were making the cartridges. They got 50 cents a day uh, to work 10 hour days uh, rolling cartridges. Um, some of the men uh, might make $1.50 to $3 a day doing some of the heavier work, loading cannon shells and that sort of thing. Um, Alexander McBride, the guy in charge of the ammunition laboratories, uh, I think only made $2 a day. Uh, it, he wasn't a high-paid uh, civilian contractor. 
Uh, so I think there, there probably was some tension between the, the government employees and the uh, civilians. And it really doesn't come out, though, uh, unless there's a political uh, incident like the one that Jim talked about, when after the explosion, uh, there's a lot of attention by the citizens of Pittsburgh focused on the arsenal and the relations between the, uh, the arsenal workers and the civilian contractors. You mentioned the young women who work there. I think it's very fascinating. Uh, we have this great exhibit behind us. Uh, do we know anything about them? What's their story? We don't know a lot about them individually. We do know that in October 1861, matches were found at the Allegheny Arsenal and most of them were boys. Now, when we use the term boys, we're talking about any male between the age of 15 and 23 who works for boys' wages. And they were playing with matches. And the Pittsburgh newspapers were livid that the commander, John Symington, wasn't taking appropriate action against them. When he finally does fire 200 boys and replaces them with girls, the same newspapers that criticized him for lack of actions were accusing him of arbitrary uh, display of wanton power. So this poor guy can't win no matter what he does. I, I do think it should be said that the Ordnance Department of the U.S. Army um, routinely used children in manufacturing of munitions. And this was happening in all industries around the country, not just in defense plants or uh, arsenals. Uh, it was said that uh, the young girls, um, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, uh, had dexterous fingers. They were used to sewing. Uh, they had to uh, roll paper cartridges out of brown paper like you'd find in a grocery bag. Uh, they would tie it off or choke off the end with thread. Uh, they'd uh, insert a, a lead bullet, uh, pour uh, a measured amount of gunpowder into the paper tube, and then fold. You have to very carefully fold the ends so the powder does doesn't come out or the ball doesn't uh, come out and then pack it in little paper packets of 10 cartridges each uh, and uh, girls were found to be uh, the most effective uh, arsenal workers and you could pay them 50 cents uh, a day uh, boys as Jim said could be hired as early as 10 years old uh, they were uh, working in government arsenals and the Ordnance Manual of 1862 specified how many uh, uh, balls a boy could cast in a day or paper tubes he could roll. They'd say in a typical 10-hour day, uh, a boy uh, could roll you know, 6,000 tubes. Or they, they would actually have it in the manual. This is what you could expect of a boy worker uh, to do. Uh, and then the men workers, uh, many of them are immigrants. Um, some of them are uh, uh, native-born uh, Americans. Um, they, they seem to divide up the workload by heavy, dirty uh, work uh, and highly skilled uh, machining kind of work. That went to men. Uh, and women did packaging, um, painting, um, linseed oiling, uh, cartridge rolling, those sorts of things. It tended to be lighter weight work and finer work. One of the fine jobs in uh, this arsenal was packing shrapnel balls in a hollow iron ball. Uh, so in, in 1804, uh, Major Henry Shrapnel of the British Army uh, invents uh, a new type of cannonball that explodes. And when it explodes, it showers little lead balls called shrapnel uh, into the enemy, and the momentum of the cannon shot carries all of that shrapnel into the enemy. Well, this was a, a major innovation because before that, uh, artillerists would fire uh, iron balls, solid iron balls, solid shot, they would call it. And you'd have to bounce those balls in amongst the ranks of the enemy, or you'd use iron shot to batter uh, enemy artillery or uh, fortifications. But this spherical case shot that had shrapnel in it was a big innovation. But it was hard to make. 
because you had to cast an iron ball with a sand casting, knock out the sand that was uh, formed the core, uh, and then insert all of these little lead balls inside, put in a tin tube, pour in gunpowder, then put a fuse on top of that. And you needed little fingers to actually get your fingers in there to do that. So uh, boys uh, often got that job. One interesting thing about using girls, they were used at other federal arsenals, but it eliminated the problem of bringing matches around gunpowder because good girls don't smoke. You know, that, that's really a good story that uh, Jim told. Um, the boys of this uh, period uh, were, were known for being you know, street urchins and hellions, and uh, they did use friction matches, which had just been invented uh, shortly before. Uh, you could take a wooden stick match and, and light it on your trouser or on almost anything just by friction. And uh, they kept those in their pockets, uh, and they kept their smoking materials. They'd roll their own cigars or whatever it is they had uh, to smoke. And whenever they had a break, they were out back puffing on these things. <laughs> well, you don't do that around gunpowder. And so when those matches were discovered uh, in the ammunition laboratories, uh, then that was time for immediate action. And to his credit, John Symington, the colonel in charge of Allegheny Arsenal, uh, he came down hard on those uh, boys, but uh, he really said, hey, let's clean them all out and get girls in there. They're much more reliable. Can we talk about Symington? He's a major player in this story. That's correct. He came to the Allegheny Arsenal in 1857. He was a career military man, graduated from West Point in 1813, and by the time he came to the Allegheny Arsenal, he already had experience because he worked at the arsenals in Washington, D.C., St. Louis, and Harper's Ferry. What's the state of the American Civil War in September of 1862? In the big picture, where are we? Well, Robert E. Lee has just invaded the North. Um, it, things are not going well for Abraham Lincoln and the Union. Uh, the eyes of the world are, are focused on Sharpsburg, Maryland, where armies are now arrayed on September 17, 1862, uh, in the, the largest battle fought up to that point, and still to this day, the deadliest day in American history. 5,000 Americans died in one day um, and tens of thousands more uh, wounded and maimed at the Battle of Antietam. Um, so that's the very day that tragedy strikes Pittsburgh. No one's looking at the arsenal. Uh, can we talk about that day, the day the tragedy struck? Absolutely. It's about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The girls are very happy because it's payday. Mm -hmm. And then as they return to work, suddenly there's the first of a series of three explosions. And what had happened was the wagon driver by the name of Joseph Frick was told, uh, take some 10 barrels of gunpowder and distribute it to various places on this wooden building that's serving as a laboratory. And he does. And there's a man by the name of Robert Frick, or I'm sorry, uh, Robert Smith, who's unloading these barrels of gunpowder. And he happens to unhead or open a barrel of gunpowder. Now, you have to keep in mind, there's 156 people working in this laboratory at the time. About half of them will be killed that very day. And they're dealing with black gunpowder. It's not like the John Wayne movies where he fights 50 guys and he still has the time to turn it and wipe out a trail of gunpowder before it blows up a building. Black gunpowder, unlike modern powder, burns extremely fast. One spark, it's over with. So Frick is asked by Smith, will you take care of some of these crates and cylinders because they're piling up on the porches all around the building. We just don't have any room. And Frick says, okay. He claims at the coroner's inquest that while he was taking his horse-drawn wagon around, suddenly he saw a spark emulating on the road and it touches off a spark, and next thing you know, there's a series of explosions. Frick is thrown from his wagon, and he says he's impaled on a garden post. Uh, the first, if you look at the diagrams that we have developed, you'll see that the, most of the people that were killed were killed in the first and the second explosion. 
by the time the third came out, most of the people had a chance to get out of the building. And uh, contrary to what some writers have written, that the entire arsenal does not blow up. It's one laboratory. But as Andy said, this is one of the worst civilian, this is the worst civilian disaster in the history of the American Civil War. And out of that 78, I believe seven were men, 71 women. Most of them are just teenage girls that were killed. Now there will be two investigations into this explosion. First is the coroner's inquest. Uh, there was a fire in the courthouse. We lost the original documents. So most of what we know comes from the newspaper accounts. And then in October 1862, John Symington calls for a military investigation into the uh, explosion. The coroner's inquest said, well, we have a hung jury here. Most of the people think that there was criminal neglect on the parts of the military and the superintendents, and a few in the minority says, no, it was just an accident that happened. John Symington did not have to participate in this investigation. He's a military man. This is a civilian inquest. He wanted to get to the root of the problem. The problem with the coroner's inquest is they take depositions. There's no cross-examination. Everything happened so fast it became hell with the lid blown off. So you could be telling the truth, think you're telling the truth, or out and out lying. And in the coroner, um, the military inquest, you can be cross-examined by John Symington or three military judges. And the military judges are furious that they're unloading barrels of gunpowder and leaving them outside on porches, and they're open. And uh, there's probably, and they, it also came out that Symington only will call witnesses that he can, uh, that are favorable to him or he can discredit. No women are called to the military inquest. And one of the men that they go after is Frick. And Symington says, Mr. Frick, you're giving the coroner this big thing about you saw this spark and this explosion, yet when Mr. McBride asked you what happened, you said, I don't know. And Frick says, well, so many things have been asked of me, I don't know what I said. And then they bring Dr. James Robinson, uh, Lawrenceville physician in, he's tending about 12 wounded people, and he says, yeah, yeah, this Frick, he came to me and he says, I have burns on my hands and I have this gaping hole in my head. But he doesn't want to take off his hat. When I finally convinced him to take off his hat, he had a scratch. He didn't have this gaping hole in the head. Now, in fairness to Frick, in those days, we did not know anything about brain swelling or concussions. So he could have actually been feeling a lot of pain. And because he didn't have this major gash in his head, they kind of fluffed him off. Now, Jim's done a lot of research on this, you can tell. And uh, just a few years ago, we even held another inquest. Uh, and we brought in Cyril Weck, the county coroner, and uh, ordinance experts uh, from around the country. And we tried to uh, have a, our own trial to see who was at fault and, and what really happened that day. And uh, there's still no agreement on what caused that initial spark. But I think everyone agrees that the powder barrels that were being used, that were being brought from the powder magazine to the ammunition laboratories, were leaking powder. Um, DuPont had taken to requesting that the Army return the barrels once they were empty, and they were refilling them. Uh, and um, uh, they weren't always tightening them up. Uh, as they should. Remember, barrels at this time uh, might have uh, uh, hickory uh, staves with uh, saplings around them. You wouldn't put iron bands around them because iron bands spark, uh, they're dangerous, and cheap barrels of that period were all made with saplings. So they tended to get loose. Uh, so you pack them on a wagon, you rattle it over a cobbled street, uh, yeah, there's going to be some leakage. Uh, many people commented that there had been a buildup of gunpowder uh, on the street by the ammunition laboratory because the girls swept out the labs every day, maybe even twice a day, and they would sweep the uh, spilled gunpowder right out onto the street. Uh, they were told that they weren't supposed to do that, but when they were in a hurry, their shift was ending, uh, they may have uh, not heeded those instructions. 
Remember, these girls were wearing special moccasins that were made with no iron in them, uh, so there wouldn't be an accidental spark. Uh, all the ladles and things that they would have used were made of brass or copper, so they wouldn't spark like uh, iron would. Uh, th these uh, folks were, uh, were conscious of the safety considerations. The firing of the boys with the matches is another example of how, how careful they were being. So it wasn't that uh, they were being negligent here, uh, but when that wagon pulled up, someone uh, said, it may have been the iron shod hoof of the horse that sparked a, a piece of granite or stone and that may have ignited the spilled gunpowder, may have flashed up into the uh, open par powder barrel that was accidentally opened. It wasn't opened on purpose, I don't think. Well, now, he opened it on purpose. He was actually taking gunpowder out and mm. putting them in smaller containers. And it's like making cookies the old-fashioned way, where Grandma made them. No matter how careful you are with that flour, it's going to spill on the floor. So well, that shouldn't have happened. It uh, shouldn't have happened, but it I, probably did. I never saw that. So that's news uh, to me that he was actually uh, transferring powder from open barrels on the loading dock. Because that, that never happened. It was not supposed to happen. It was against the rules to happen. So if that's true, that came, that's the smoking gun, Jim. Uh, that you, came you've out discovered of the military inquest, I believe. It important. was in there. And they, the military inquest said, we I can conclude that there was an explosion that caused loss of lives and property. And it may have been caused by the actions of this deceased Robert Smith climbing on a barrel gunpowder. Now, in his testimony, Frick said that Smith was crossing over barrels of gunpowder, which would mean he's stepping over them. And they asked him, did Robert Smith have nails in his boots? And Frick said, I can't answer that. But there was, while they were providing moccasins for the girls, they did not have adequate number of moccasins for the men. And oftentimes they would come with thick leather boots or even nails in their boots that acted like cleats. So the leather would actually Especially the longer. dray men or the delivery men, uh, they weren't required to wear special uh, gear. It was really the people who worked in the labs uh, that had to wear uh, and take special precautions. Plus the road. You have to consider the road. Originally it was a dirt road, and so every time you went over it, there were ruts and uh, gunpowders shaking out of the barrels, as Andy said. But... When they did put in a road, it was called a macadam road, and it's basically like your stone gravel driveway. It uses a combination of large stones and small stones. Well, some of the accounts say that it was a hard stone, some say it was a flinty stone. Most likely, the material that was used in that road was very frequently found in Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania. It's called chert and it has a high concentration of iron and flint. So if we would have been there when the explosion happened, what would we have seen? It was a day of horror. Uh, as Jim said, about two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, many of the girls were lining up to get their pay. Uh, it was payday. Uh, some were still in the laboratories working. And then this horrific boom, uh, rips through the laboratories starting at the loading dock. There's a second boom. It's so loud that it's heard all over town. Windows are blown out uh, from adjacent windows. Um, people go flying, body parts. They talk about intestines being spread out over uh, the grounds, limbs falling in trees blocks away. Um, the fire is intense and it goes almost immediately. Girls are rushing to the windows. They, they're crushed together on the stairs. They're trying to get out. They just throw themselves out the windows on fire. Alexander McBride, the superintendent of the labs, he rushes back into one of the burning buildings. He's looking for his daughter. Kate McBride is a 15-year-old cartridge uh, roller. He comes in just in time to see the trusses of the roof on fire collapsing on the girls. He never finds his daughter, or at least he's not there in time to save her. He does pound out the flames on other girls' clothing and drags them out. 
it's a curious thing. We think about fashion and we imagine that these girls wearing practical clothing uh, of a factory worker, a lot of them were wearing hoop skirts. I'm serious, hoop skirts, not just the uh, uh, satin or silk or wool or linsey woolsey uh, dress material, but actual hoops underneath them because at the end of the day, uh, people commented on the steel spring hoops being all that was uh, visible uh, amid the skeletons of the girls. Many of those girls were so badly burned that uh, their families couldn't identify their bodies. And they were packed up into small boxes and uh, miniature coffins. Um, it was a scene of horror that Pittsburgh will never forget. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, after, in the aftermath of the explosion, the people of the city were, were angry they wanted to find a scapegoat. They wanted to find an answer. Uh, what was it that killed their, their daughters and their sons? And so that coroner's inquest that Jim talked about was very important in sort of the, the healing process for Pittsburgh. They wanted closure, but they wanted to know who to blame it on. And Symington had to get out of town. I mean, he, uh, he was exonerated by the military uh, inquiry, but the coroner's inquest pointed the finger at him uh, and also Lieutenant Eddy and- And Jasper Myers. And Jasper Myers. These are the subordinates of Symington. And uh, these people in Pittsburgh, well, they wanted blood. Well, I think what's interesting about Alexander McBride as late as the early 1900s, he's trying to get compensation for the families of the victims of the Allegheny Arsenal, but it was to no avail. Also, when Andy described this horror scene of body parts flying all over the place, it's kind of, it, it only takes about 20 minutes for the entire laboratory to be destroyed. So what you're facing here are all these exploding cartridges and you got thick white smoke from the burning powder. You have these burning timbers giving off thick black smoke. There has to be the terrible stench of burning bodies. Uh, they identified 45 people out of 78 killed. They were able to identify 45 bodies. And most of them were buried in Allegheny Cemetery. And uh, although there's a monument that was erected in 1928 that uh, lists all 78 names, um, I believe there's about 12 girls that were actually buried in adjoining St. Mary's Cemetery. And there was one person that was buried in Beaver County. Mm -hmm. This is a horrible event by any standard, but why don't more Americans know about this in the greater story of the Civil War? I think the reason America doesn't know about it today and didn't focus on it in 1862 was that it was happening at exactly the same time as the deadliest day in American history, the Battle of Antietam, uh, only 100 miles away. And the nation and the world turned its attention to that horror. Uh, so this, this tragedy in Pittsburgh just compounded that, that terrible tragedy. Well, that in addition to the fact that I really don't think Pittsburgh has a deep appreciation for its history and its heritage. When we celebrated our 250th anniversary of the fall of Fort Duquesne and the founding of Pittsburgh per se, how did we celebrate? We planted 250 trees. Now that's an Arbor Day celebration. <laughs> that's not a historical celebration. And I think, as Andy said, it was a minor event compared to what happened at Antietam. But as a result, in 2012, of what Andy and his staff did here with Cold Case, bringing in a mock trial, bringing in a forensic expert like Cyril Wecht, who's internationally renowned, and other, famous, uh, other people that were familiar with the Allegheny Arsenal, that started to turn the attention. Uh, but also that, uh, to commemorate that horrible event and to honor the 78 people killed, in September 2012, the Lawrenceville Historical Society and the Sons of the Union Veterans actually held a one-day event in Arsenal Park where we brought in reenactors, we brought in can Civil War cannons, we brought in a gunpowder uh, demonstration to show the difference between slow-burning modern powder, which pops up in the 1890s, 
versus black gunpowder. Uh, we also had some presentations. Uh, there were also a number of lectures put on by the Lawrenceville Historical Society to various historical societies and Civil War roundtables throughout the area. And I think the first time that this event made its way past the New Pittsburgh newspapers, because this 150th anniversary did make the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Pittsburgh Tribune Review, a, an East End newspaper called The Bulletin, and the Pittsburgh Catholic, but it was picked up by the Associated Press and was carried in at least 15 major newspapers across the country. I'll tell you what's really made the news lately, though. Just uh, two weeks ago, a cache of 300 cannonballs was found at Allegheny Arsenal as they were excavating with a backhoe for some new apartments that were going in there. And uh, talk about uh, memory and history. Uh, people in Pittsburgh, I think, did know about the Allegheny Arsenal explosion. They had, they had heard of the good work that the Lawrenceville Historical Society has done, and they had been to, here to the History Center to, to see our Allegheny Arsenal exhibit or taken part in that cold case trial that we did. And so when they found 300 cannonballs, people said, whoa, we're sitting on top of a time bomb. It could go any minute. Uh, but what, uh, what I think we can help people understand is that those old spherical balls, those round balls with uh, black gunpowder inside, are really very stable. Uh, they're not like modern gunpowder, nitrocellulose powder, uh, dynamite that was uh, invented by uh, Alfred Nobel in 1865, uh, you, you know, you've heard about dynamite sweating and how it can snap and pop uh, it, when it gets old. Uh, that happens with modern uh, explosives. But during the Civil War, they were using black powder, charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter. And over time, that actually degrades. Uh, after it's been wet, uh, uh, often it won't even uh, light with uh, a blowtorch. And so these shells that we'll show you some uh, from our collection, uh, these shells have uh, pewter fuses on them that are made so they can't go off accidentally. They're made to be bounced around in a caisson going over hill and dale, rolling around. You have to put fire into them to get them to explode. Uh, you can't hit them with a hammer, drop them off a building, or roll them around on the ground to make them go off. So when people find these spherical projectiles uh, in their backyards in Lawrenceville or at a construction site, uh, they do the right thing to call in the, the police and let the uh, historians and the, uh, the bomb squad uh, deal with them. But they're really very stable, and we don't have to worry about a recurrence of the tragedy of 1862. Well, what I found interesting about what Andy said is it demonstrates how far we came in the last 40 years because in 1972, they found 1,200 of these spherical mm. cannonballs. And I did talk to a county detective at, with the bomb squad at the time, and he says, oh, it's very unstable. Uh, you got to really be careful with this stuff. And that was the prevailing philosophy well into the 1990s. If you have one of these shells, get rid of it, it's dangerous, it's a hand grenade ready to go off. And uh, now with uh, new technology, with foam, uh, we're able to stabilize these and hopefully Andy will get a hold of all 300 and have one of his bomb squad experts defuse them. We, we do have some specimens here that were found in 1972 at Allegheny Arsenal and we've cut them in half. You can see the shrapnel balls in there, you can see the bursting charge and the pewter Borman fuse that makes these both safe in transport and handling, uh, but very deadly uh, when you uh, insert fire into them and burst them over an enemy. Well, in 1972, they actually took the ones they found and took them out to Fort Indian Town Gap to be destroyed because they thought, well, they're just too dangerous to have laying around. Uh, Jim, you live in Lawrenceville. If we went there today, what could we see that's left of the arsenal? There's probably only, in addition to some of the remnants of walls, there are four buildings. One is what everybody calls the stone hut inside Arsenal Park. That was the gunpowder magazine. It was capable of holding 1,300 barrels of gunpowder, although I doubt it was ever filled to capacity. 
And that's probably one of the oldest buildings in the city of Pittsburgh, as far as I can tell. It was built between 1817 and 1819. There are two garages near Penn and 39th Street, which are run by the county facilities, the county health facilities. And these were, they called them laboratories at the time. And one of them is probably one of the oldest municipal buildings still in use. And then where they found the cannonballs just recently, there was a building that they're building for warehousing and then they changed it to officer's quarters in 1866. But uh, we really don't have a real appreciation of our heritage because those walls are in terrible shape and the county owns a portion of that property and a number of years ago they took down a portion of wall and it's still sitting pile of stones on their property. They never rebuilt it. Reminders of Allegheny Arsenal are really all about us. In some of the other buildings in Lawrenceville, uh, you can see pieces and parts of the old arsenal when it was uh, dismantled in the early 1900s. Uh, people uh, adapted, uh, reused pieces of it. People who are digging in their gardens might find melted lead mini balls uh, from that terrible day in 1862. Fragments, scraps of brass and iron uh, from the, the military shops that went on there. Uh, even some of the privies uh, that are in the backyards uh, bear evidence of the people who lived uh, around the arsenal and worked there. Uh, and you'll find uh, bullets and uh, cartridge fragments and military uh, gear, some of it stolen. They had a real problem with uh, workers taking home things and then selling them on the black market. Uh, but you'll also see the patent medicine bottles and toys and uh, broken pipes and the everyday things of the people who made Allegheny Arsenal the arsenal of the Union. Uh, what, in your opinion, should be the ultimate legacy of this event? We always close with this question, so we'll throw it out. I'd like to see that the memory of these 78 American patriots is preserved. It wasn't until 2012, after 150 years, that they finally started to get some recognition. And I hope they don't have to wait another 150 years before we have a series of events to commemorate their patriotism. And I think there are a couple of things, uh, lessons that we can learn from this. Uh, one is that uh, the war is not just fought on the battlefield. Uh, there's fighting on the home front. There are people who are sacrificing and dying uh, to help support the Union war effort. And these 78 uh, young women and girls uh, paid the ultimate price. I think it's also interesting that it happened here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh, known as an industrial uh, center, the arsenal of the Union, uh, but also the home of Rosie the Riveter. You know that, that We Can Do It poster that came out in February of 1943? It was done right here in Pittsburgh by a Westinghouse artist by the name of J. Howard Miller. And he was impressed by the women war workers here uh, during World War II. And he came out with that poster. He said, we can do it. The same week that a popular song hit the radio called Rosie the Riveter. And so now, wherever you go around the world, when you see that we can do it poster and uh, uh, you're reminded, Rosie the Riveter, She's really been around for a long time, uh, from the American Revolution to the Civil War uh, to today. Uh, women have been part of our, our military past. On that note, I'd like to thank my guests for joining us today. As always, if you have questions about today's episode or recommendations for future episodes, please visit our website at PCNTV.com. For everybody here at Battlefield, Pennsylvania, I'm Brady Kreitzer saying so long. Thank you.